Hey there, I am thankful for you. And if you stick around, I'll show you how to make this awesome little mini quilt from my friend Karen over at Sew and Save in Racine, Wisconsin. Oh, I do just absolutely love to collaborate with my friends. So again, Karen over at Sew and Save in Racine, Wisconsin. Thank you so very much for allowing me to play with another one of your super fun mini quilts using the Michael Miller Basics. If you're brand new to making it fun, everybody, I am Rob Appel from Michael Miller Fabrics. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so excited you're here. And I love to teach quilting and all kinds of other sewing and do silly stuff as well with these cameras. And today's project is another mini quilt like we did before. Now, now this was the window heart quilt and this was started at the beginning of our um, lockdown for COVID. We were putting these in our windows just to say thank you. We really appreciate all of you essential workers out there. So there's still fantastic patterns available uh, at Sew and Save on their website uh, to do this one. And again, we are doing little donations for those essential workers. So like this one, today's pattern is also a purchased pattern. So I will avoid the actual numbers. I will leave out, uh, I will protect the innocent is what I'm saying. I'm just being silly, but I will walk you through the steps. But of course, you'll need to have the pattern for today's project because I would love for you to make, help us make a donation um, and work with this wonderful, thankful project here. And again, they're very, very affordable. It supports a local quilt shop, supports a local community, and it's super fun. And you're always asking, where can we get the kits? Where can we get the kits on what we see on your show? And remember, I'm trying to support all of the local quilt shops out there, but there are opportunities where a local quilt shop will say, Rob, would you do our project? So there is a kit available. And again, it's available at Sew and Save's website. That link is in the description below. We're using Michael Miller Basics, some of my very, very favorites, the hash dot. And so we've got clementine and papaya and mustard and gold. We've got a little bit of our linen colored marble. We've got our bright white cotton couture, our onyx marble. We've got the uh, ebony. Oh, I got it right. Oh, of the hash dot as well. Now this is an amazing new texture. I am so so excited about this. This is brand new. This is cocoa. This is fantastic. It looks like a tweed. And on our applique in today's project, we're going to use just a little bit of our pistachio color and our tangerine color. So this was really fun. This just got in the shops when Karen was starting to put together the kits for the samples and stuff. So we're going to have a bunch of fun. I'm going to show you how to do the patchwork starting now. This is basically where we're going for our background with my color choices using, like I said, those Michael Miller basics. So if you look real carefully, you're kind of seeing seeing like a square and a square and a square if you look at the oranges you're seeing in the background. So we're going to focus on those orange patchwork blocks first and build that out and then get into the applique. So with my oranges, I'm going to need two of each rectangles, okay? And of my lighter two oranges, my rectangles are more narrow, giving some clues, more narrow than my darker two rectangles. Okay, so there's a little bit of your supply list. And of course, that's listed in that pattern you just purchased. Again, thank you for that. Now with those, we also will need to each of the squares of the light colored oranges that we're using for the background to build in these really cool um, little kind of diamonds the way they come together. And it's a pretty really neat block. I really enjoyed learning how to make this. So this is really cool. So in order to do that, um, what we're really gonna do is we're gonna take our rectangles and what I want you to focus on real quick right here is what we're gonna do with this color, we're gonna do it twice, okay? And so I've already started building one of these units. This is what it's gonna look like when it's done. And if I just rotate this so that you can kind of visualize this exterior border, that's the white that's going around the outside there. Well, then this is going to be its mirror block, okay? And so with this mirror block, that means of these two colors, I made these exactly the same. And then I'm putting this triangle, this square, we're gonna sew across this line here in a, in a second. That is now on the opposite side of the next color of our orange. So setting that aside, and I forgot while we're going through the supply list, of course, you're going to need some squares, some smaller squares. You'll need some rectangles, some medium sized rectangles and some small rectangles as well while you're there. Okay. I know we're having fun here today. That's why I'm the maker of fun at making it fun. Oh, if, however, if you're new to sewing, let me slow down a little bit and show you what we're really going to do. Now this 
is going to create that triangular block. So I'm going to just actually sew with my sewing machine right along that line. And I put that line there with a fine tip Sharpie marker and a ruler on my square. And I do that first so that I can get a really nice crisp sewing line. So when I come over to my sewing machine, even if I have like an edge guide on my presser foot, when I lower my presser foot, I'm just going to lower it right onto the needle there. And I'm going to stitch through. And just right on through, real nice and easy. Now, as I come over here, I am going to need a rotary cutter and a ruler real quick off the old tool wall. And what we're going to do, and this is mostly to protect our hands and just get good habits, is I'm just going to lay basically a quarter inch seam allowance on that drawn sewing line we just did a moment ago. That has now been cut, folded over, and now I'm going to take my iron and then what I really want to do is I want to press it so that I don't show much of the seam as often as possible. So I want my light fabric on the table, iron going to hit that seam just like that. And that will go ahead and press over our seam nicely and then prevent any kind of bleed through there. And we're going to do that as often as possible. Now for this, the next thing we're going to need to do is put on our longest rectangle from our supply list. That's going to go on right along there, right sides together. And that definitely was top touching, excuse me, touching the top of that triangle. That's the key to putting it on that side of the rectangle there. And again, pressing to uh, hide or pressing to the dark side, laying my white fabric or my light fabric on the table, pressing over. And now that this portion is completed. Now, just show you again real quick. Here is the finished unit we're building. And so I have the um, long rectangle. Now we're going to put the medium rectangle opposite where our triangle is. So that's real simple. I just grab that there. I'm going to take this, lay it there right sides together. If you wanted to trim a little bit, you could. But again, we don't have to be too absolute on this section yet because it's all going to line up so nice here in a moment. Take a moment and press that over as well. Try to press that seam back in towards those darker fabrics just to keep that bleed through down if we can. Okay, and just as a reminder, right, so we have that one that we just made and there's the one I had prepared earlier. So they're identical and the other color is in the opposite orientation. And then for the light oranges, remember we had two of the light and then two of the dark oranges. We need to make some squares that are going to match in and have a very similar feel here. Maybe if I put that there, you can see it a little bit better. So now in order to do this, we're going to start the same exact way. I'm going to take one of the squares I had. I'm going to take one of my small squares with the drawn line, line it up. And right now it really doesn't matter which direction it's facing. So I'm just going to go ahead and stitch just like I did before. And like before, we're going to trim it before we press it using our ruler to keep our hands safe. Again, pressing into the dark side by starting on your light fabric. And now at this moment, you can really rotate this to fit in any way. But what I need you to do is make two of them that are exactly the same again. So now you can see you have the one triangle on, we're going to call it the right upper corner, right upper corner. So I'm going to take my smallest of my rectangles I had from the supply list, set it right there and on you go. Now in order to get that information, please just check the pattern for your orientation. It'll show you that. And the reminder is once again, you're doing two exactly the same. And then the next color will be opposite of those two. And as these are all complete, we basically have built the parts necessary for those lighter corners. Now let's do the darker corners and they're actually going to be centers really when we get back down to putting it all together. Okay, let's keep ourselves organized though for a little bit longer if at all possible. So now with that said, this is what this unit's going to look like, right? It's basically a flying geese unit, flying goose. If it's only one, I don't know, but we're going to start with those larger size rectangles like we had before. 
OK. And then again, I'm going to take the larger squares. And what I want you to do is I want you to sew one on first, edge to edge. And of course, those lines were already pre-drawn on there by yours truly, meaning mine were. They're not in the kit. You'll have to draw your own. I don't want to take all the fun away, right? Think about how disappointed you would be if you opened up your kit and I had already drawn all the lines or stitched it all together. And the key to this kind of a block unit is to make sure, again, we're going to go ahead and trim these off. And depending on how small a quilts you like to make, this is getting into the almost savable size. So you may want to save that for future use. I'm just going to kind of slide it away there and decide later. But right now, I'm going to do the same trick I did earlier. And I'm just going to go ahead and, oh, actually, I'm not, that's not true. Right now, to make life easier, is I'm going to press from the rectangle into the square. So technically breaking all of our wonderful quilting rules, pressing now into the lighter fabric, but things sometimes just happen this way. They just really do. Because what I want to do is make life easy so when we make this next triangle, that seam is now out of my way. And in order to do that, I just want you to double check that when you drop your second square into your position that you now are basically forming a triangle. So you follow this line up, look at this line coming back down. There's your triangle, super simple. And again, an easy seam allowance. We'll put that in place. And before I go to the iron, I will once again trim this off to make my life much easier. Setting that aside. And a quick reminder, because we're working with a square project today, you're actually going to need two each of these. So remember, because I used four oranges, I created two from each of those colors as well. And that was pretty dang easy if you ask me. Now the next thing we're going to do is let's go ahead and take this and build this all out together. But I'm going to set this on the design wall for a moment just to keep it up and out of our way. Now the center features a square and I would like to go ahead and just take a moment because I've had it laying about and just go ahead and press it out. Now this is a really cool fabric. It's our marble fabric. And this linen color, you can almost not tell which side the print it is. It's a wonderful, just very light mottling. So just double check real quick what you're looking at. Make sure you've got it dialed in to the way you want it. And now we're gonna go ahead and put on our interior borders first before we put on the rest of our blocks. So in order to do that, we have our little strips that we've already cut of our ebony hash dot. I want you to fold these right sides out. So you're looking at the print, you're gonna fold them in half, long and skinny. Okay, now this is going to be the portion in the video that I hope Karen has gotten up to go refill her bowl of popcorn and doesn't notice that I'm not actually going to put the piping in like the pattern calls for. For a variety of reasons, but the easiest, most easy to, to explain is I didn't have the right piping. I thought I did, and what I really had was an eighth inch nylon, and this is for gear. This is not at all the right stuff. You want a quarter inch and a nice soft piping, but I can show you how to set it up, and we'll just omit it today because I did in the sample when I was building it to begin with. Either way, your project is going to be super cute because this is just going to add dimension later on. So if you want to add in your piping, what I want you to do is now that you've pressed this right sides out, I want you to just kind of slightly open it back up. You'll be setting your piping in like yay. And then you're going to go ahead and set this right sides together facing interior raw edges on the exterior right. And then what I recommend is you use your zipper foot and go on with like an eighth inch seam allowance, a real light seam allowance using your zipper foot to put that on because we're going to catch it with the quarter inch when we put on the other block pieces. For me, like I said, I just happen to have the wrong stuff. So I'm going to set that aside. So now just to make life easy, all I'm going to do is just take our piping strips and they're not quite long enough uh, to get uh, cut them in half. So we're just going to take, make sure you've got plenty on either side. Like I said, right sides together, make sure you've got your fabric and the orientation you want. And now I'm going to be looking at all the raw edges again as I come over here with my, oh, 
and I'm not doing a quarter inch now. I'm going to do less than a quarter of an inch because I don't want this thread to show later if I don't do a perfect job sewing. And I can almost guarantee I won't do a perfect job sewing. I never have before. So now what I'm going to do, let me put my presser foot back up, is I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat right over. That's right. I'm going to look at my foot now or my fabric just on the inside because all I'm doing right now is just securing this. Okay, just securing it on to hold it to make it much easier when I sew on the other pieces. Make sure everything stays lined up. And actually, not only did I put on one, but I put on the other opposite side while you weren't looking as well. Sometimes that's just easier. And I don't know if you can see in the overhead camera or not, but I mean, I just barely made that in a couple spots. And that's what I want you to do as well. So once you have both sides, opposite sides, before you do anything else, just take a ruler and the longer your ruler, the better it is. Cause again, you're lining that up nice and square, trim that off. So it's the perfect size. Come on down here. Why don't you catch this one while you're at it? Do this to the other side, and then once these sides are trimmed off, we can then successfully put on the other two sides of our piping, whether this was done with the actual quarter inch piping inside or not, right? This would be your same approach. Now I'm going to lay these over this way, making sure that my raw edges are all on the outside, right sides together, all that kind of jazz. And again, just less than a quarter inch as we're putting that on there. Now that all of our pieces are made, we're going to be able to go ahead and drop these in very simply. What I want you to go ahead and do now is start with those shorter, chubbier little uh, rectangles we were working with, putting the same color on opposite sides of our center. Okay. And then the other color on the opposites. And you can see, I'm just kind of centering it right now. We're just going to dry fit all of this. And now as I look for this little triangle here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to match that triangle up to another one of my triangles on the inside. So you see how, boom, I just found it like that. So this little triangle is what I'm trying to point out now. So that means that the, uh, this is going to come right over here to the opposite. You see how easy that fits in. And then let's go ahead and do, um, so you'll have these longer runs, okay? These will be the secondary pieces we put on and then we'll put on our short runs. That's where the squares are gonna go here in a moment as we lay this out, just matching to the triangles. And then you're just looking for the same color to work with when you bring your triangles back around. And then just be real careful, you're matching up a triangle here and then this outside. See, that's what makes it look like it's like a shorter portion or fits within the block. It's just so cool the way Karen did that. So anyways, that's gonna fit in. Bringing over my other color here and like that. And this is just a really good time to make sure that you have everything just the way you want it. Because from this point on, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to sew these short blocks together and then I'm going to put them on. So I'll be right back to show you what that looks like. One trick I'll point out as I'm getting ready to put on one of the short sides to begin with is I'm going to do it so that I overlap all of those parts and pieces when I put on that interior border. Quick reminder, all of that white goes to the exterior of our block. So you're sewing across your print colors right now. And now as I come in here, I'm gonna hit this with a full quarter inch seam allowance, edge to edge. And this will catch all of it, secure all of it, but also make it so none of the pre-stitching shows up with our less than quarter inch seam allowance. Quick reminder, if you have the piping in here, you are doing that with a zipper foot where you now see me doing it with a quarter inch foot. I told you there were many reasons why I didn't like the piping. Huh. Now I'm kidding, Karen, Karen, remember you're still back getting popcorn. Okay, now real quick, I'm gonna go over here and I'm just gonna carefully, because of that piped edge, I'm gonna press on here now, I'm pressing out 
away from center. As I get ready to drop the long sides in, I just want to do some color matching, make sure everybody's just where they belong. And then once again, I'm going to line them all up, utilizing all of these little seam allowances now as my little checkpoint as I go through. Again, either a quarter inch seam allowance or a zipper foot so that you can secure all of that piping if you chose to in there. And like before, we're going to press the long sides out and away also, taking care of our piping we put in or our flat interior. Sometimes I'll call that a flange. And because we're just focused on our construction at this point, let's go ahead and take a moment and finish the entire quilt top before we start our applique. And I'll be happy to show you how to do the applique as well. It's one of my favorite parts. Okay. So, what we're going to do now is in your kit, you also had the wonderful um, onyx or black color. I think it's called onyx. And this is that cool marble. And what I want to point out real quickly is now, because you have enough to get these strips, right? The length of the goods. One of these strips is just slightly longer than half or you know what I'm trying to say. Cut one of them in half and then go back and put that across the union. See, we're crisscrossing our seams to make them stronger and stronger as we build out our block. So I've already got those ones on there. So I'm going to start using that. But just a reminder, take one of these three strips, cut it in half and start with those as your short sides. Take your selvages off as you're getting started. Then you'll need your other two strips for the long sides and you'll have some leftovers. But as I was saying, I want to bounce into the applique. And in order to get ready for the applique, let me show you what we've got to work with. Of course, you'll have your quilt top already built like you see over on the design wall. And now we're going to bounce into our wonderful fabrics. Now we have jet black and our cocoa in our tangerine and pistachio colors, plus a bit of the heat and bond, which is a material we use for what we call fusible applique. Your pattern has already been prepared for fusible applique, which means it's already been reversed for you. Because it's been reversed, you're probably going to want to use a light table or a window and secure your pattern and a bit of the heat and bond feather light with the smooth side up and the rough side down. Then use like a fine tip Sharpie marker or a pencil, but I prefer something that glides and, and go ahead and trace all of the shapes that you see. Once the shapes are, that you see have already been traced onto the fusible web, cut out each individual section of fusible web per pattern pieces like the word thankful or the pumpkin or the stem and leaves, and then go ahead and iron those onto the back side of the appropriate fabrics. And as you can see here, I've got that already finished up now. And there's a couple of different ways that you can cut these appliques. And if you don't know, I'm the cool inventor of the shark applique cutter. This is a 14 millimeter, very tiny freestyle rotary cutter for this kind of work. And on this pumpkin, it's perfect for this reason. I want you to hold it like a pen and I'm going to get in here and I'm just going to go ahead and I'm actually kind of moving the fabric and the tool as I go. And I can either trace around the outside of all of this pumpkin to begin with, which is really easy. Like you see like this. Okay. And now I also put the pieces all the way on and I didn't trim right on the edge earlier because I want to trim now right on the edge because that way when I cut this out, I have the heat and bond also on the edge all the way to the very edge of my fabric piece. And that's what helps it act like a fray block or fray check from way back when. Okay, and we're just gonna go ahead, and I like to keep my pieces in order. It will make them easier to put back in to our sample as we're done. And you can see how nice something like the Shark Rotary Cutter works for this basic geometric shape freestyle cutting. 
But that word thankful, there's no way I could do that with the small rotary cutter. So something like thankful, I'm gonna use a very small pair of scissors. And then what I do is I just come in here and I actually open the scissor blade up and I let it close and then I advance. Open it up, let it close. And as I get into those corners, that's why I'm gonna to try to go ahead and bend that corner as I move my way around. And the reason I do that is because if you nibble away very small little snippy snippies, it'll show up on the edge of the applique and that makes the edge of your applique look rough. And because I didn't like that rough look of the edge of the applique, that's why I went and invented the tiny little rotary cutter so that we could get a super smooth and clean cut as you go. Now you can see this takes a little bit more focus and concentration for me. So I probably better get these cut out nice and perfect and join all of you back here in a few moments with these pieces already shaped out and show you how they get put in the center of our project today. Then once all of the little pieces and parts are cut out, just go ahead and grab your center again. And then I'm just gonna rotate it. I'm just a kind of a thing for color and light source. And this is my brightest, so I just kind of want it up in this upper right hand corner for myself. It's just a personal thing, no big deal. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab this iron and I'm just gonna really focus on the center. Make sure it's basically nice and smooth, no wrinkles, no bumps or anything going on in there. You don't need to preheat for fusible web. You just wanna make sure you don't have wrinkles because we are gonna iron this into place. So then let's go ahead and start with our word, thankful. And then I'm gonna just kind of roll at one of the edges and start to grab a hold of that paper and peel up, making sure that the glue stays behind. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and lay it briefly, because we're gonna need to get everything in place before we do all of the fine positioning. We want our pumpkin center about dead center. So I'm gonna start with that about there visually. You can already tell I want that down just a little lower. Now I'm using tweezers Oops, I was doing that backwards. And then as far as your gap goes, depending on how you f intend to finish this, you may want to leave a little bit larger or a little bit narrower gap, meaning that if you were going to blanket stitch this, you probably want to have a little bit larger distance between your shapes so that you're not putting a bunch of thread on top of thread as you go there. And then for me, I'm gonna actually finish this all out with some free motion machine quilting, just doing that right along the edge to secure all of my different little pieces. Also sometimes I like to use a stiletto when doing my layout like this. That was pretty handy too. I do keep the stiletto handy in case I ever can't get an edge to lift, then I can sneak in there on that and just go ahead and peel it right up. As well as it is nice for moving pieces and parts around like that. And then for the character. Loops facing down. Take a couple looks, make sure you have it exactly the way you want it. Once everything is double checked, now when you go in with your hot dry iron, I want you to go ahead and literally just push down like yay, let it rest out one, two, three seconds and then straight back up and then move to the next section. I don't want you sliding your iron at all at this point because you could accidentally hit something that's not secure and cause it to go for a little bit of an upside down ride and get wild and you didn't want that at all. So like I said, now everything is awesome, completely secured. We're gonna go ahead and put a piece 
piece of batting behind this that's just a few inches larger all the way around. I'm going to use that wonderful cocoa pistachio color on the back as well. And like I said, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in starting with the free motion machine quilting. I'm going to stitch right along the little edges with matching color thread to hold all of my pieces in place. And then I'm just going to do some very basic machine quilting, some probably some very straight line machine quilting because I feel like the colors and the layout we've chosen for all of this has got a bit more of a modern feel. So I'm going to try to make the quilting lend to that style or that genre of quilting as well. So I might have a little bit of fun in the background, but primarily I'll follow Karen's patterns and do mostly some triangle and triangle and straight line work around the outside border. And I will show you that here in just a moment. I'll be back with it all stitched up. And there it is, looking terrific. I'm really proud of the way this turned out. And again, I'm very, very thankful for my friend Karen over at Sew and Save in Racine, Wisconsin for sharing this awesome project with all of us. Make sure you pick up your pattern. Make sure you visit Karen's website for the kit. And we will see you all very, very soon right here with another episode of Making It Fun. What? Are you actually still here? That's fantastic. Make sure you check out some more of my other fabulous content right here on YouTube. I think it's terrific. Please subscribe while you're there and make sure you hit that little notification bell so you don't miss another moment of the fun.